it's the beginning of a new type of lectures, I guess, because we have a lot of people joining us online, um, but we also have a lot of people here in person. Uh, so it's a pleasure for me to introduce this evening's speaker. Uh, Oren Hardy is the co-founder of Bamboo U and the Cool Cool Farm two sustainable edu sustainability education enterprises based in Bali. He dedicates his time to creating spaces and opening up new possibilities for people to live their lives closer to nature and themselves. Combining his international expertise with local knowledge, Oren facilitates and teaches courses related to permaculture design, gardening and bamboo construction. Along with his team, Oren has welcomed hundreds of people from all over the world to participate in these programs. Raised in a Balinese village, surrounded by rivers and the jungle, he then moved to North America, where he witnessed this disconnect between humans and nature in the modern world. He now spends his time devoted to reconnect people uh, with nature. His most recent endeavors have been to tackle the challenge of bringing Bamboo you online in order to adapt to the realities of a world grappling with the COVID pandemic. So thank you so much, Oren, for joining us here this evening. And we look forward to hear all about and see all about these, these challenges. Thanks so much uh, for having me. Can you guys hear me? I don't know if you can. Testing, testing. Yes, you can hear me, right? Anybody not hear me in the back? A little louder, OK. It's supposed to be a microphone, but kind of working. Okay, well, um, I have a bunch of slides to show you. My name's Oren. I've already been introduced. Thank you very much. Uh, this is also my first in-person lecture, in -person lecture since COVID-19, so it's super exciting. Uh, and I obviously want to tell you a little bit about Bamboo U, which is something uh, that I've been working on uh, in Bali uh, with lots of incredible people. Uh, and then hopefully we'll inspire some questions and we can have, have a conversation. So when I graduated from university, I felt pretty overwhelmed by the numerous problems. I wrote lots of papers on how messed up the world was. Uh, but I really didn't feel empowered to create solutions or, or to do things that would, would lead to be better outcomes. Um, and I kind of wanted to just retreat. So I had this fantasy of living a simple life. I dreamed about gardening, picking chilies uh, out of my little food forest. Uh, I tried to make this dream a reality, but pretty quickly I realized that uh, farming wasn't actually that simple. Vegetables aren't a very good way of making any money. And um, my interests were a lot broader than uh, just, you know, my chili. So um, organic vegetable production in Bali, uh, you know, it, it, it really wasn't a very good business model uh, for my farm. But I realized pretty quickly that I could actually charge people to plant the vegetables and then tell them that lunch is free. Uh, and that, that worked. Um, so, so we started running a whole lot of courses. Uh, this is my wife, Maria. Uh, and we really started our journey with the Kukul Farm. And it was really just about teaching people about all the different methods of sustainability. And we would invite different experts from different parts of the world uh, to teach us about herbal medicine, permaculture design, gardening, cheese making, chickens, mushrooms, you know, you name it, all kinds of different, different whatever we could kind of imagine. And interestingly, bamboo workshops weren't really at the top of the list. Uh, and, and it may have been a bit of a family issue. Um, my, my father, uh, this is my dad, uh, John, he was really pushing for the bamboo courses. Uh, but I was his son, so obviously I didn't want to do that um, because it was his idea. Uh, and, you know, he and my sister were, were already doing a lot of really cool bamboo stuff. And I was like, no, I'm just going to be a farmer. Um, but the problem was people kept coming to my farm and asking for a bamboo workshop. Uh, and I was like, you know, getting the writing was kind of all over the wall. And Maria and I were like, well, um, maybe it wouldn't be such a bad idea. Let's, let's run a bamboo workshop. Uh, and 
there's a reason that they were all coming to my farm back to Alabama workshops, and that's because uh, beginning in the early 2000s, my dad had this kind of crisis of conscience. Uh, he loved wood, and, and his love for wood led to a bit of a building addiction. Um, but he had this crisis where he's like, well, every time I build with wood, I'm, I'm destroying the rainforest, and, and he really wanted to do his best to, to, to make sure that whatever he was building was, was not actually harming the environment. And he really decided bamboo was the answer. Um, and it would allow him to kind of continue his building passion uh, without, you know, without destroying the world. So um, when he and my stepmother, Cynthia, they decided to build uh, a jewelry showroom. They had a jewelry business at the time. And, and they made this kind of bold move. They're like, what if we build our showroom where we sell our jewelry at the factory out of bamboo? And that was really the beginning of taking this poor man's timber. In Asia, bamboo was really seen, especially that time, as, as something that you used if you didn't have any wood. Um, and, and, and they took it and they elevated it to a status of luxury. Um, and, you know, bamboo is often compared to wood, but it's really not. It doesn't have anything to do with wood other than the fact that it's, you know, got lignin and cellulose like wood. But it's, it's not, uh, from a botanical point of view, that, that's not what it is. So uh, it's really a grass that kind of, took advantage of the fact that, you know, warm, wet, tropical areas allowed it to grow to relatively enormous sizes. Uh, and if you take this cutting and you put it in the ground today, in eight to ten years, you'll have a sustainable source of timber for generations. Uh, once the clump, clump is established, it takes, you know, three months um, for one pole to go to full height. And then three to four years later, it's ready to harvest. Uh, in some cases, a pole can go to 30 or 40 meters. Uh, most, I'd say that the usable length of that is around uh, 14 to 16 meters uh, for, for construction. Now, the really cool thing about bamboo is it really responds well to harvesting. So you can actually encourage it to grow faster by harvesting it. And when you harvest it, you're actually creating space. If you do it properly, you're, you're creating space for the new shoots to grow. And then you're increasing its carbon capturing potential as well, because you're taking it out of the forest and you're putting it into durable products. And that then leads you um, to store more carbon than if you would just have a, a, a bamboo clump without any harvesting happens. Because after about five or six years, they die anyway, uh, the poles. But it's not invulnerable. and um, you can over harvest a clump and damage that clump and you can actually degrade the resource so it's still important to understand how to harvest it and to make sure you do it properly uh, there are over 1600 species of bamboo in the world and a hundred of these are economically important in bali we use just seven different species for our construction project in 2006 uh, my dad and Cynthia, um, they founded this incredible school called the Green School. And that was, in a lot of ways, the beginning of a new construction industry with bamboo in Bali. And these buildings really inspired others to understand the power of bamboo as a resource and to take it seriously. But starting a bamboo construction industry wasn't actually a very small task. Uh, it, in, it required building a factory to process and treat all the poles because uh, bamboo, if it's left untreated, is eaten to dust uh, by something called the powder post beetle uh, within two to three years. But once you treat it with uh, we use borax, which is relatively non-toxic, um, you can actually make sure that each pole lasts a lifetime. The pole, it's light, uh, it's strong, and it does take a little bit of manpower to get it out of the forest and turn it into something uh, suitable for construction. Here you can see they're actually punching a hole through each bamboo comb or bamboo pole uh, in order to make sure that the, the treatment solution soaks into all, all of the, the whole pole. Uh, so Green School is really the beginning of the story. And when it was finished, my sister Laura founded the design firm Ibuku. And they built over 100 unique bamboo structures in Bali and abroad. Uh, this is Sharma Springs. Uh, and it's really 
It's, a, it's actually a home. It's got six levels, and it sits on the, the side of a river valley. And it really, you know, showed how we could really take bamboo to a whole nother level. And they're still doing this, uh, innovating every year. This recently they built this incredible structure. It's called the Ark. Uh, it's on the Green School campus. It just won an award uh, through Design. Um, serves as a gymnasium for students. And it's also an example of how to push the limits with bamboo. It's got 12 different arches, and they were they at super rigidity through a series of curved anticlastic grids that you can see kind of between even between each in those triangles we have these, these grid cells and it spans 19 meters and, and that's as far as we know the largest arch and the tallest arch bamboo structure in the world today. Um, interestingly one of the workshops that Bamboo U acted as the prototype to come up with this system. Uh, here we built a series of grids uh, with students a video and if it plays doesn't look like it anyway you see the photo is it playing yay okay so um it's a series of grids and we actually uh put them together and it allowed us to create really large fans with a relatively small uh, species of bamboo you can see here it coming to place uh it was really became you know became clear that bamboo became this place for us to test new ideas in construction um, and it was really fun because we get to include students or people from all over the world in that process. Um, I had no idea how to teach a bamboo construction or design course when I started uh, with Maria, but we decided the best way to teach what we do was to actually do it. So we created this program where people actually get to build real structures during each course. Um, and very quickly, one 11-day course turned into six courses a year. In each course, we pushed the limits. Uh, and we looked at you know how to what what we could really accomplish with a group of around 30 or 40 people from all over the world. So that has been um, really fun. And, and what's fun is a lot of these people don't have any experience in construction, uh, but but they have an interest in bamboo and usually some kind of background, either in engineering, design, architecture. We do get a few carpenters. And you know if I think about my ancestors, uh, they were pioneers in North America, my recent ancestors, and. And they really came together to build. Uh, they didn't hire an architect. They didn't have a contractor. They had to put up their own homes themselves. Uh, and so we did this in community, and, and everybody came together and, and helped each other to build their homes. We call that you know, a barn raising. Um, and I think all of our ancestors participated in the act of building a lot more than we do in our current society. Um, and I feel like the act of making all of our needs now is, is very far removed from from our daily life and something about that uh, feels like it needs to change i feel like getting our hands dirty and understanding the full process of construction really uh helps us understand the materials we use it definitely helps us understand bamboo better and it really uh helps us understand the process of construction rather than just the object of construction uh you know modern Construction, as you guys know, is dominated by sand, steel, and cement, but um, if we're going to continue using resource-intensive materials, you know, we, we know that it's going to bring about our own demise. Um, concrete's really served us well for the past 100 years, but I don't really believe it's going to carry us into the next century, which we're in now, the 21st century. And we don't change the way we build. I don't know that our home or where we build our home and the planet we're living on is going to be worth living on. I don't really believe any of us want to perpetuate this into the future. But if we can build simple, if we can build things like this with hand tools, um, with a few skilled carpenters and a group of students who have little experience working with their hands, what will happen if we start applying more sophisticated, te more sophisticated technology to these processes? Even this structure was actually designed by a, you know, she had a lot of help, but it was basically designed by a 23 year old architect who was working with us, who had very little experience as well, uh, but he did have some guidance. You know, many of our ideas, they start and they move out of our minds and they become sketches. 
and their clues to what the final structure will look like. And yes, technology has worked its way into our process and it's unlocking a lot of new possibilities. This is a, a grasshopper uh, rhino model we did for a structure. But we have to be careful because even digital design software, um, if it's used as our final blueprint, sometimes the back end that way. It won't actually, it won't match the material. So we still create models um, to make sure that, that it works. This structure uh, is a little meditation pod with a, with a canvas epoxy covering. We had to build it twice before we got it right partly because we were using technology as our guide rather than following the limitations of the material. And I can't help but feel often simple design um, with a simple model accomplish a lot of the goals that, that we need to achieve. This is the last structure that we did with uh, students in Bali before COVID-19 uh, changed a lot of things in the world. Uh, it's a resting place for local farmers who are working with uh, transitioning to organic rice cultivation uh, near, near where we are in Bali. And, you know, I'm a really strong believer in human connection, so COVID was not my favorite thing, uh, to say the least. And the thing I love more than the bamboo is the people that I get to meet because of the bamboo. And when the international borders closed in 2020, uh, we really only had one option. We had to either close Bamboo U or take it online. So uh, that's what we did. And, and, you know, it was difficult because we really prided ourselves on look at what we can have people make if they come join us. Uh, these are some things that students uh, designed and developed during one of our programs. And, uh, but the reality was we, there was some blessings and COVID did push us to expand both our reach and it took Bamboo you to a different level. Um, we've had close to 500 people enrolled in our online course, almost uh, as many as came to learn with us before uh, COVID-19. So almost as many people took the online course as people have come in person since 2016 uh, when we started. And they don't meet in person, but the message of bamboo is still spreading and people's dreams are still coming to life. Uh, during the program, people get to make the model that they want to build. So this is a, a bamboo center in Uganda by uh, a woman named Sunny, and she plans, plans on, she actually, this is a project she plans on building. Here's some of her concept models. Um, this is a restaurant built on top of a building ruined by a tsunami in Sri Lanka, developed by Lisa. Here you can see some of our concept design models as well. Uh, this is a pavilion, a beach pavilion in the Philippines designed by Bea. And, and she's actually not an architect, she has a background in, in, in craft and jewelry design. And you can see here it's, uh, it's really inspired by, by her local culture. So it's, it's inspired by the, a traditional hat worn in the Philippines. And she wanted to create this kind of space inside that gave shelter, but, but also defined inside and outside in a, in a meaningful and, and interesting way. Now, online learning still has its limitations and it's not a substitute for hands-on learning, um, but you know, the online course has given students a lot more chance to develop their ideas and receive feedback just because it's longer and they don't have to make the journey to Bali so they can spend more time on it. Um, and it's, us to reach a lot more students that wouldn't be able to come to Bali, and that's been very exciting. And it's also allowed us to reach a lot more instructors. So we've had all kinds of different guest lecturers uh, from all over the world informing and joining the course and sharing their experience with Bamboo, depending on, on where they are. Now our next kind of mission is to take Bamboo U into a Bamboo University and develop an actual program that's one or two years long um, and, and with credit. So we're, we're really excited to, to explore opportunities in doing that. And um, Bamboo U has really been more about, more than just about teaching what we do about Bamboo uh, in Bali and, and more about creating a platform 
that allow different minds to come together and develop new solutions to bring bamboo into uh, this century. I went to university in a building that was, you know, at the time called a green building. Uh, it was designed to be a green village building, and it may have been efficient uh, and or more efficient than some of the other structures on the campus, but somehow I don't feel like this is the measure of green architecture. Uh, and, you know, I asked myself the question, will my grandchildren fight to keep this structure standing or will they have to be happy to tear it down? My bamboo classroom may not last 100 years, but I know that people are likely going to fight to keep it up for as long as it holds. And, you know, bamboo is really a perfect material to build sustainably and to build beautifully. But most of the world still sees it as an exotic material, something you know that's appropriate for Bali or to build somewhere in the jungle. And many people who join Bamboo U really, you know, they say, "Well, this is great what you've done in Bali, but you know, this is only possible in Bali." Uh, and and what about where I am? And I like to, you know, respond and say, well, 15 years ago, nobody in Bali would have said this was possible. Uh, and, and we didn't know uh, that it was going to be possible. And I wonder what will happen when people in the modern world, when, when really bright minds who have gone to university and actually, you know, have a lot of training, take this material seriously, you know, what are they going to develop? And, and what will bamboo look like in 10 years? You know, what what are we going to see that we haven't dreamed of? Um, I think that there's a lot more potential and there's a lot more capacity for bamboo all over the world than even what we have done in Bali with, in a lot of ways, not a whole lot of research, relatively simple understanding and, and the help of some you know, crazy people willing to try and, and, some, and some skilled local craftsmen. So thank you very much. Do you have any questions? I was actually going to say that. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, thank you very much. And uh, thank, thank you for the presentation. I think it's been inspiring to you. And again, we are super. Come over here. Oh, it clicks a bit uh, in and out. OK. Again, OK. If I talk, it works. So and we are super happy that we a Q&A in person, which is something super cool. So I will start with a question as a way to warm up. Bring you the microphone uh, if it works. Um, so, Ori, here you show a process of architecture that happens almost hands on. It's like you, you design where you're building. Um, could you tell me more about how you actually split the design as we understand design um, in architecture, sitting in our desk and thinking, and then the construction part? Is there a boundary? Is there no boundary? And on top of that, what kind of tools you use for design? Uh, we talked this morning, we had a long chat about even um, the potential use of digital tools for that. I don't know if you already have um, an idea after everything you've seen here about um, how digital tools could help. If they won't help at all, what's your vision of that? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a process. So it's not just like we're, you know, the bamboo speaks to us and we're like, Oh, okay. Uh, no, no, there's a process. Uh, it, you know, there's a con it, and it, it's, it's a very traditional process in a lot of ways. You know, there's a concept design process, and especially there's also, you know, is there a client involved or are you building for yourself, right? So, Bamboo U has much more flexibility than, let's say, Ibuku, who has a, a client. And so, they follow a very strict process from concept to, uh, you know, detailed design and then to, to construction drawings. And then that gets handed over to construction and construction. Uh, builds it, and then there's usually a dialogue where, where then, you know, which parts need to be changed, and they change, you know, it's, a, it's the same, it's a, it's, a, it's a very similar thing to, I think, the way a lot of construction works, but, and a lot of design works, but I think the difference is that we come from this place of really focusing on uh, developing designs based on the materials we're using, so the material, I mean, bamboo is the main material, and then the other materials 
that we use are all decided very early. Um, so, 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 and there's this conversation that happens from the beginning in how that's going to work. And, and we do use software. Uh, some of the buildings at BAMDU are actually early buildings that use things like Grasshopper and Rhino. Uh, when we started, it was all, you, it could all just be analog. The CAD drawings were often just like for, for regulation to get like a building permit. Um, you, you know, we do them retroactively. Uh, it's like, okay, let's find someone. And, and, you know, the architects, you have to be a very specific kind of architect to be willing to, uh, to turn one of these buildings into a CAD line, especially the organic structures where they're doing, you know, copying everything to be exactly what the bamboo model is. But, but we're very, so the bamboo model is the, the blueprint of this the site, and that's what the car carpenters understand. So you can really just simplify it down to like, okay, build a bamboo model, um, make sure it stands up. And for a bigger building, you get a real engineer to do that. And for something small, you can figure it out yourself. Uh, and then, and then, and then that goes to the, the carpenter. Uh, but there is a lot of software, especially for the engineering, and also for, um, for you know, if, if you're getting a, a building permit. They want all the traditional, you know, uh, sections and, and floor plans, and, and, but, but it's not actually necessary to build a building. Um, but it does play a role, and, and it also depends on the complexity of the project. So like a residential house, there's a lot more detailing, let's say, than a, a, a bamboo campus pavilion, um, which we literally built a, a basic uh, rhino model, had, a, had that translated into a, a, a physical model that was done by hand, and then we get, went straight into construction and, and, and figured out a lot of the issues along the way and had the engineer kind of coach us as we went. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, you said something this morning that connects with these bits. Has resonates really well, I think, in the way that Yak approaches um, uh, tools, which is the idea that um, we are not here to use existing tools. We are here to build tools uh, by yourself that serve the specific purpose of the innovation you want to drive. And I think, yeah, in a way, you know, um, what, what you all come out is, and what you're doing is develop your own tools uh, for design. I mean, that's, we use very simple tools to build any of those structures, there's only one, the, the arch, the arc I showed you involved a crane. We had a few structures involve a crane, but that's very new. Up until last year, you could fit all of the tools on this table to build any of those structures. And, and so there's a lot of tools missing. We're taking wood tools and turning bamboo, but we really want bamboo tools for bamboo, and that doesn't exist yet, so. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, thanks for your lecture. It's awesome. Uh, I think I saw your dad's TED talk. Like yeah, yeah. Ten I'm years ago. School. Yeah, uh huh. When I was in high school in Alaska. And oh, so wow. now it's really cool to be here <laughs> <laughs> hearing you talk about the, the evolution, right? It's progressing, as you say. So having seen the progress of building with bamboo in Bali, do you have a vision for? what it potentially might look like in the future, taking this sort of um, architecture to places like the States where the building codes are super strict and maybe like very outdated and so on and so forth. How do we build these beautiful things in uh, places where the regulatory structure is uh, tough? Can I jump in before you answer? Because we have a question from online and I also had a question which was similar. So I'm just gonna read out the one from Florian online. Um, what keeps a lot of architects from building with bamboo in the Western world? Uh, for example, in Germany is among other factors uh, that there are very strict regulations and no real DNA, uh, DIN norm uh, with bamboo um, as a constructive material. This is mostly due to the fact that bamboo is hard to classify because each home in its in its, its own way, I guess, is unique, yeah. yeah. So can you speak about your experience in building regulations in bamboo in these countries? And my question was a little bit sort of at a bigger perspective. How do you imagine the replicability of the bamboo construction? Do you imagine exporting the technique to be able to use the bamboo per se in places where it might not be autochthonous? Or do you imagine that we would be learning from your experiences with bamboo and understanding how we can integrate that maybe into other natural material systems for construction? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of layers to this question. The, the most basic layer is the regulations need to change because a lot of them are ridiculous. Um, so that's the first thing. 
And there are people working on that. There's even bamboo buildings that have gone through the regulatory process in existence in Hawaii. Um, there's a company there called Living Bamboo that does that. There's people, I think, in Florida that spend a, a it's, you have to spend, the problem is you have to spend ridiculous amounts of money to get anything approved that's different, right? So, so that really requires a push, like it actually needs, like it's like a lot of things in sustainability where we actually need to change the rules. Um, that being said, there's still gonna be more regulations because in Bali we kind of just tried it and hoped that they wouldn't, you know, tear it down, you know what I mean? Like, and, and, and luckily they didn't and, and they, they let us kind of do that and, and they were getting building permits for these structures, um, but it was risky. Like it wasn't like it was all, done and dusted and then we went and built a bamboo building. We, we built bamboo buildings knowing that this was a risk. Um, and uh, and so, so, you know, we really need to change some of those rules and there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done with engineering. There's the ISO standards for bamboo that just came out this year. So it's happening, it's just obviously not as fast as anybody would like. As that happens, um, you really need to find little footholds right, whether it's with temporary structures or whether it's with festival structures or whether it's with bamboo structures on wheels, you know, whatever it is, to get in the door so that you can start that dialogue with your agencies, right? And, and I, I obviously don't know how to do that, but, but the people who want to use bamboo in the industrial world, I really feel like need to do that. And then obviously the experience, the tolerance, right? And, and I think that's just a matter of testing and there's, there's different people doing that. But again, I think there's funding missing to do the test the right amount of time to get them approved. But there is, there is things happening. So like the ISO has approved a standard for bamboo um, this year actually, so that's exciting. And uh, I mean like Neil Thomas, who's one of our, who engineered, he engineered the ARC, um, he helped engineer the, the bamboo hall I showed you. Uh, and he is working with championing bamboo in different parts of the world. He, you know, he says it's either, it has to be, safe by code or by other proven means, right? So, so probably we're often just for our own conscience when we're building these big buildings, we're, we're actually making smaller versions of the building, prototyping them and hanging barrels full of water and documenting what the modulus of elasticity is and what the modulus of rupture is for the different ways we're building. So, so it's kind of an ongoing process um, and needs to be, needs to be documented. I hope that answers your question. Um, I mean, you know, the living, uh, the Earthship guy is a good example of, you know, somebody who's, he got his architectural license revoked because he cared more about doing his work than whether he was an architect. That's kind of an extreme example in the, in the US, but a lot of the time the code needs to catch up with what we're trying to do, right, on a sustainability level. Uh, any more questions here? Well, first, sure. Secondly, I've seen that for structure uh, beams and this stuff, sometimes you slice the bamboo and then do like like a big, big bigger beam with the uh, with these slicings. Yeah, get like the members. curvature. How do you solve the foundations to be sustainable also? The foundations, I mean. By definition, they're much more sustainable because they're lighter, because the building's lighter. So you're not building the same kind of footprint that you'd need for a concrete or brick or a house, right? So by definition, they're already foot, they're, they're foot, they're not a giant pad. Beyond that, you know, you have to kind of, just because you're being really sustainable with bamboo, sometimes you have to give a little bit, right? If there was an alternative to concrete, we'd take it, but so far there isn't. I did actually build a concrete-free building in Bali uh, using bio epoxy mixed with resin, and it worked. Uh, we did it, and the building's standing, but it's highly impractical. Impractical. It just the level of precision alone would be enough to scare most builders away. So, so, um, so you know, I think it's about the fact that your building's much lighter. As, a, as an element, so you're, you're, you're using a lot less concrete uh, than you would be if you're building with a heavier material. Thank you. Uh, Hello. 
thank you very much for the for the talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you about um, an aspect that I perceive as um, quite a big challenge also for uh, the development of bamboo architecture, maybe more in in uh, countries where bamboo is native. Uh -huh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I met some people uh, um, that were involved with bamboo in Colombia. Yeah. And um, what I saw there, that was uh, maybe like five years ago, is um, the, the, the more than the technical things or the possibilities of it, uh, where the, the, the way people relate to the material. Mm -hmm. So as you said, um, it was seen as a poor man's timber. And uh, so it was more used, um, obviously, for, for uh, what, uh, as a poor man's timber, or then um, in some big projects by Simon Vélez and all these people, and, and maybe it was um, starting to get more acceptance, and uh, maybe also uh, from high-end projects, you know, that, that we're starting to uh, have this shift in, in mentality and accepting bamboo also as a new material with more possibilities. And yeah, I would like to ask how you see that also in Southeast Asia or um, in some other places. I mean, to be honest, I think the greatest gift of the fact that we're, most of our projects are, are basically high-end projects, so especially Buku, the people paying to do this. I mean, you know, if we got a grant to do affordable housing for people, we'd probably take it, right? Because that would be an interesting challenge. But the reality is right now, most of it is for high-end clients, and they're all kind of wow structures. And that has a gift in it, which is it is elevating the material, and it's become so trendy in Bali that there's like there's way more bamboo buildings being built than what we build, and and sometimes to our detriment, right? Because there a lot of them are just copies of what we've been doing, um, and 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 in some ways it's flattering, in other ways they don't necessarily do it right. Uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Uh, but it's 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 a it's there's no kind of copyright law they are stopping anybody, so it's become its own industry, uh, and, and that's because it's been elevated, right, because people are seeing it no longer as a poor man's timber, and they're seeing it as a, as a point of interest, something that makes Bali more unique, um, and they're seeing it as something that tourists want, which means that uh, it's becoming a bit of a status symbol in some ways, um, which, you know, is controversial, but it's also kind of interesting, where all of a sudden this 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 very sustainable material is being something desirable. It's a little bit like bamboo is being gentrified. Bamboo is being gentrified, you know, or becoming fashionable, you know. So 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 that has its its its, its pros, and obviously, I'm sure there are impacts as well that we unforeseen impacts that are, are not as good. Uh, but in Colombia, Simon Velas is doing the same thing, right? In in, uh, and there's interesting work being done where it is being applied to low-income housing <coughs> and, and not necessarily as, as wealthy projects. And it's becoming, I think, th there's a ways to do that as well. Uh, Lucia Aguilar in Mexico is doing projects in plantations. She's building bamboo structures uh, for the farmers there. There's, in the Philippines, base build is doing uh, very cool pajarete. Uh, structures where it's all bamboo covered in mud. It's much stronger than the concrete buildings when the, when the uh, typhoons come through. We have, okay. yes, okay. We have a couple of questions from our online audience. Uh, so I'm gonna make one question out of two questions from Yervans and Lee. Um, so you spoke a little bit about this in your talk, but how durable is bamboo um, and how long does a structure more or less last and what are the maintenance requirements? Um, and then Leif was wondering if you could talk a bit more about the different ways to treat the bamboo and the trade-offs on durability versus toxicity. Great question. Uh, so the first honest answer that we don't want to talk about is we don't really know how long a bamboo structure will last. In theory, once it's treated with borax, it'll last a very long time because it's a, it's a, the chemistry of it, it's, it's crystalline, so it has a very long half-life. Uh, but then it really depends on how well you design your structures, and where you see it start to fail over time is actually in the joinery, which is where the metal meets the bamboo. 
So that's another kind of a technological barrier, right? Where if we could join bamboo in new ways, it'll probably last longer. There are bamboo buildings um, in Latin America, in Japan, that are 100 years old. Um, and you know, I've, I've heard rumors there's actually a bamboo structure from the 1800s in Buckingham Palace. I haven't actually seen it, but but uh, you know, there there's definitely if it's designed well, it has the potential to last a very long time. Um, we would say, I think, like the, the buildings that I sent you, I'd, I'd hope at the very least, if they're maintained properly, they'll last about you know 30 plus years uh, before they need major renovation. Um, beyond that, the the toxicity is a good question. You can treat bamboo with highly toxic chemicals and put it outside like you can a, a fence post, a pine post that's been you, you chromium copper sulfate. I'm not a chemist, but there's some very toxic stuff. And, and if you treat bamboo with that, you can put it outside and, and it'll no, no fungus and no bugs will eat it. But then again, there's the toxicity question. With borax, you have to keep it away from the sun and you have to keep it away from moisture. And then you have to make sure your joinery is done. And, and a lot of the early structures we built that stood up, um, the, the larger ones at Green School, some of them you start to see the, they start to sag over time. And, and they were really built kind of let's get the place done quickly and 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 now you know there's there's some studies being done where it's like oh that's and, and it's luckily it's not like they fall over one day like it's not like in florida where all of a sudden the whole thing collapses um and nobody knew there was i knew people knew there was a problem but like you know uh it it, it wasn't apparent to the resident the bamboo kind of slowly you know shifts over uh, and you're like oh it's slowly falling and maybe in two years we'll have to change that um so that's the good news. And again, it, it, for me, it brings up the question of durability. How long do our buildings really need to last? Um, you know, do we really need all buildings to last 100 years? You know, there's a certain arrogance and hubris. You know, do we want a lot of the buildings that I see? I don't. I hope that we build something better soon. Uh, they're not very beautiful, and and they're not very livable. So 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 a lot of the times, I feel like our buildings get torn down before their time is up anyway, because they're overbuilt basically. Yeah, do that, <laughs> um, and maybe we can make uh, maybe we can make a shout out to Buckingham Palace um, if you if they're following if they can invite Aaron over he wants to see the structure. <laughs> yeah, I, haven't, I haven't seen it, but I heard rumors. <laughs> we want to know if the rumors are true. Um, so we have um, a couple of more questions online. Um, so uh, we have Pablo who was wondering a little bit about uh, aside from using bamboo in its original form. Um, have there been any consideration about bamboo in a CLT or laminated form? I saw you had the the paving in in your your dad's sort of project, but maybe. So, I bit. mean, I would love to have much more sophisticated processing methods, but it's a it's a question of scale. Um, to get the machines to build competitively priced bamboo uh, strand woven bamboo bamboo laminate, um, you know. Com uh, Fiber, fiber boards, all of that stuff requires a huge amount of investment um, because it's, they're hundreds or not millions of dollars. And then you need to produce enough material to justify the machine and you end up in this kind of dark cycle where all of a sudden we'll be you know, using all of the bamboo in Bali very quickly. Um, so, so I'm excited about micro, micro uh, applications of those technologies. So I've been talking to uh, a guy named Felix from Top Value um, and he's taking chopsticks in Vancouver, uh, and he's got 300 restaurants giving him chopsticks on a weekly basis, and he's turning them into uh, tiles uh, using a micro press, and it's like it's like the size of this building, 200 meters squared, and then he's upcycling those into products and reselling them all over the city as a locally you know sourced product. Uh, just based on a waste product. So it's a, a really good example of uh, circular economy in practice. So people like that are really exciting because they're taking um, large scale technology and they're miniaturizing it so that we can apply it to, uh, you know, to a, 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 more, a more manageable scale. Um, was another question here, so. Oh, 
Okay, yes. I tell you, you could yell, but the TV works as a Faraday cage, so it. Thank you. I don't think it likes you. The microphone. Okay, you can come up on his mind. Okay, this one works. Is oh wow okay. <laughs> Um, that I know that bamboo can be a very invasive species in a lot of different countries. Obviously, in Bali, it's native. And first, my question was, is it, um, does it ever happen in Bali that it chokes out other parts of the forest? And also, uh, as bamboo architecture might grow as a sustainable solution, how would you... Um, how would you advise other countries where bamboo is not native to be able to control the, the, the plantation so it doesn't choke out natural species? Like uh, here in Spain, there's a big problem with um, eucalypt, for example. Um, yeah. In permaculture, we have this great say, saying, which is the problem is the solution. I don't know. I, I mean, so, so there's two types of bamboo. Let's start there. There's monopodial and sympodial bamboo. Um, monopodial bamboo is the running bamboo, and that's the one that's quote unquote invasive. I don't really believe in invasive species. I'm going to be, I'm a little bit biased, but at this point, I think it's kind of like, you know, we're so far down the track. But, but that being said, if you have a, a, a pristine, you know, native habitat, uh, obviously don't plant bamboo there. Um, there's plenty of degraded land to go around where we've planted all kinds of other invasive species already um, that are not doing as well or aren't as are much more destructive. So we should really focus on that land for bamboo if it's in a non-native area. Um, and also in a place like Europe, I would suggest focusing on the clumping varieties if you're worried about that. Um, I feel like it's pretty sensitive to water. so. Yeah, I'm not an ecologist, but it's definitely something to think about. And I think in our courses, we always start with bamboo as a plant. So we actually have somebody in Indonesia who's doing projects with local villagers to plant more bamboo and to make sure it's done properly. Because it is, you know, we could have a, like, palm oil is a great plant, right? But if you plant it in a monoculture all over the rainforest, obviously it's no longer so good. Um, and there is that risk with bamboo, where all of a sudden we've got monocultures tearing down the rainforest to plant bamboo. Obviously, that's not good, and, and that's why we need to take a systemic approach. And really, you know, 30% of a landscape, if you have a rainforest, you wouldn't want to go over 30% to be bamboo, and you'd want to do it in combination with other um, local species to make sure that you, you create an actual ecosystem. Um, and that requires you to work with villagers. In a place like Europe, you know, if you took degraded land and you created a bamboo plantation, it would be like farming anything else, right? So you need to take the different things into consideration and make sure you're doing it in the right place. Um, and it's not, and it's important to remember that the clumping varieties really aren't invasive because they don't move very quickly. Um, the, the, the ones that exist, and those are most of the ones that exist in the tropical world. So we don't have the same issue that you have with the running bamboo that kind of crawls over and, and goes into, into the other person's property. Oh, okay. Actually, on that direction, uh, for the ones that are in Barcelona, as you studying here, you want to see more how people, in a way, it's, it's not using the move, it's similar local species. There's a collective called Caña Viva. You could search for them online and they are of course, they cannot achieve the same the same results, uh, but they use uh, locally, uh, let's say, original uh, plants. And I think I really want to add that we don't, we're not imagining that everybody everybody builds bamboo structures like we're building in Bali all over the world, right? That's not the point. The point is that we developed buildings that were expressions of that place combined. So it's a, it's a combination of 
of what that place has to offer and the innovation we're able to bring to it, right? So in Spain, I really hope that if they're gonna build bamboo buildings, uh, like I saw some beautiful photos with that chain mixing earth, you know, that speaks to me as an expression of this place, right? So that's also part of relocalizing. Um, I hope that people learn how to listen to their context and, and, and not try and create a solution for everywhere all the time but also find solutions that work for the place that you are and, and learn how to apply the local gifts and, and, the, and the creativity and, and how a place really speaks to you. The considering the of the approach of the Mm. It's a great question. Uh, so, you know, we'll have carpenters, right, boat builders, uh, and, and carpenters from the West coming to our, our programs, and even some people who have digital fabrication knowledge. But the carpenters go, they're doing that with their hand, but like, you know, I get my, first I get my table saw, and, you know, I'd cut the right angle and it'd be really precise, and then I'll get my uh, skill saw, and then I'll get my Dremel tool, and you've already had like four tools, and the Balinese guy just whips out his knife, and, you know, Three minutes later, you have a fish now. And the guy's like, why do I need all those tools? I can do it in my hand, right? Um, so there's efficiency and there's economics in that process because they don't have access to those tools. You know, if you have a hammer, everything's a nail. And, and in the West, that's we're suffering from. If you have a tool, you have to use it, you know? And I mean, your beautiful robot, which I really love, by the way, uh, it's, it's not going to compete with the Balinese women in the village doing the, they're just going to kick its butt um, at this point. Uh, that being said, digital technology really has, a, I think there's a big opportunity because I, I don't believe it should be like an either or, or it's not a competition, right? The, poor, the point is to develop technology that supports our humanity. Um, and I feel like if our intentions are right, that's what we will do. And I, you know, I'd love to see that robot carve a fish mouth, but I guarantee you it's going to take much longer than the guy at this point because it's going to take a lot longer just to scan the particular pole in relation to the other pole and get them to fit together. But if technology could get to the point where you could take a photograph of both and put it into the computer and have the robot make it, that would also be incredible, right? So, so I, don't, I don't see it as an either or, and, and I think that when we design things, we really need to take humans into account, right? And not, not to use technology as a way to take humans out of the equation, but use it as a way to enhance. Uh, so I'm really excited also to bring digital technology and digital design ideas to Bali in collaboration with what we already do there with carpenters, right? I don't, I don't see it as a, somebody still has to put the building up and, uh, and, and, and yeah, I think it's, I think it's a win-win. Okay. Uh, well, I'd like to know that uh, what about training a team for building like housing, like uh, how feasible is? Because I imagine it's like in my city or in, in Colombia, but we don't have like uh, a team of people who already knows how to work with the concrete. What does it take to train? How big should it be? Uh, I think I got that. It's, it's in and out. But but I think what you're saying is if you're in a place where you don't have carpenters, you know. If you're in a place without uh, knowledge of bamboo, so building bamboo, how long would it take to potentially train a team who could be in that place to build houses with bamboo? 
um, and how many people would you would you need in that team? And I was actually going to ask something similar, which is what who, considering that you guys are also learning about the material, the process of growing. I mean, you're really looking at bamboo from every single perspective. What's your dream team in some way uh, to keep going with the bamboo U project? Um, let me start with the first question. So. I don't know. There's definitely been Balinese carpenters exported to different parts of the world in training. If you were just to focus on being like these carpenters, it's in their cultural DNA. So they come from villages where people do that, right? They, they were doing woodworking, carving, and so it wasn't a big leap to go to bamboo. So I think the, the most efficient way to do it is to find the craftspeople that have analog uh, skills in different places and bring one or two or three people to help them with those skills um, in order to go to bamboo. But even with ba bamboo, U was a good challenge in Bali because we were trying to find new ways to, um, to get people who don't have any experience with their hands to build, right? So all of our participants don't have the, the capacity of the carpenters. So a lot of our designs were dictated by that. So there's a lot more um, modularity a lot less kind of organic shapes because a lot more uh, reciprocal powers because we needed things that limited the amount of joints and the amount of things that required a skilled carpenter to do. And I, th I think it's actually a lot easier than we might make it out to do, but it, I think it's also a time and money equation. So how many, how much money do you have to, for how many people can you send? And then uh, how much time do you have? But I feel like if you sent a group of Balinese carpenters to train a whole lot of people in another country. We actually have an inquiry right now for a, a country asking us to send a team to teach their craft people how to build bamboo. So if it goes through in a year, we'll be able to tell you exactly how long it takes. It took us 10 years, right? Um, I feel like we could probably do it in two years if we had to go, okay, let's set up a bamboo industry and act if we had the support of, if we had financial support and, and, and government support, I feel like we could do it in a, in a few years if it happened very quickly. And my dream team, we have so many people coming that are so cool, like so many different types of people all the time. We have this gift in Bali. It's just like, there's too many people to know what to do with. Even with our course, there's too many lecturers out there that we want to include to get them all in. So, so I mean, you know, my dream team is people that will cooperate with each other because that's usually the hardest part, right? I like to think we have all the solutions in the world to solve all our problems but we don't get along, so they don't necessarily happen. So uh, I think the, the main thing is really collaboration, you know, humility, uh, willingness to listen, <laughs> soft skills. So any more questions? Okay, so uh, Oren, thank you very much for joining tonight and for being the first physical lecture here at IAC. I think we might enjoy being in person and not behind the screen. And also, uh, thank you very much for the ones online for uh, joining us. So see you soon with another YAG lecture.